right. Thank you for staying with the Monday Reporter just in time for the discussion. Here's how this format is going to work tonight. We are going to give you back the microphone, okay? Ask all the questions you may have in terms of the new health insurance scheme. We are moving from NHIF to SHIF, Social Health Insurance Fund. Why? Why was it necessary? What are the gaps that you see? This is why I have my panelists here with me tonight. Dr. Timothy Oluen, Chairperson, Social Health Authority. Thank you very much for making time. Dr. Davji Atela, Secretary General, KMPDU. Thank you very much for making time. Mary Christine, National Treasurer, Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. Thank you very much for making time. And Martin Onyango, Center for Reproductive Rights. Thank you very much for making time. So, Chair, I'll start with you on this question. There's been a bit of confusion as to why they move from NHIF to SHIF was even necessary. So give us the background of that first before the rest of the clinical officers pose their questions to you. Mm? Yeah. Great. Thanks for inviting me to discuss this very important topical issue at this point. Um, the conceptualization of the Social Health Authority is a culmination of a series of events. First, we appreciate that the government has got a constitutional mandate to be able to provide the highest attainable standard of health care to its citizens, which is a constitutional right since we enacted the 2010 constitution. In addition to that, there was a realization that there were certain, certain shortcomings in our healthcare system which needed to be fixed. So much as we had a healthcare system that was working, I think we are all in agreement that there were some shortcomings that needed to be addressed. So the question was, how do we, source, how do we fix that? And based on the experience that we had with NHIF, it is also important for us to mention that the mandate of the social health authorities much wider. I had you mention SHIF only, but that's just one of the funds that is under the social health authority. So first, we appreciated that there has been an overemphasis on curative treatment. And that in itself is not optimal, and it is agreed worldwide. You know, since 1978, there was a declaration that we should focus on primary health care. So now we are going further downstream, uh, I'll call it upstream, in terms of saying we start with preventive and promotive health care. Because even according to UHC principles, universal health coverage, you should provide the entire range of services. So we have got a primary care fund which is going to focus mainly on preventive and promotive health care. There are benefits that accrue down the road because the principle of us teaching time saves nine works even in health care. So at the end of the day, even if we were to bring down our health care costs, we need to first of all concentrate on preventive and promotive health care so that we reduce the number of people who are moving into the curative phase. Even in the curative phase, there were a lot of things that are making, for example, our expenditure become inordinately high. And in terms of financing, even the curative aspects, there's a problem with healthcare financing. And that is within the mandate of the Social Health Authority. Because we don't provide healthcare, we're not meant to provide healthcare ourselves, just like NHIF did not, but we're supposed to finance, finance healthcare. So again, in terms of financing, it is very inequitable. The contribution structure was inequitable in as far as you should have, ideally, a healthcare contribution structure that is progressive. Progressive meaning compared to ability to pay. Ability to pay should, should vary with the proportion of your income that you're spending on healthcare payments. What we had before was one that's reg regressive. And if you put it simply, for example, if you had somebody who's earning 5,000 shillings, contributing 500 shillings a month, all right, that contrib constitutes 10% of their total income. Whereas you had the person earning 100,000 is contributing 1,700 a month. Ideally, it should be the reverse. Those who earn more should actually contribute more. That's the principle of social health insurance. Out-of-pocket payments were too high. We were spending on average almost 150 billion shillings a year out of our total health expenditure of about 550 billion on out-of-pocket expenditure. That is the most inequitable, again, system. So we needed to get rid of out-of-pocket payments. We need to make the contribution structure more equitable. And in addition to that, in, in line with UHC principles, again, we need to provide the entire range of services. We also had the, uh, Section 43.2 of our constitution. Mm. You're supposed to, nobody's supposed to be denied emergency care. And that is in our law. However, there was a fund which was proposed in the 2017 Health Act. It was never operationalized. The question was whose space? It's the responsibility of the state. So the government now has decided to step up and say, we're going to take this responsibility. So we've got another fund which takes care of emergencies, which is going to be for all Kenyans. Mm. In addition to that, there was the aspect of people running out of funds, even within NHIF as a fund itself. So again, the concept of financial risk protection which is one of the UHC principles, meant that we, do, we should not have people getting impoverished because of making healthcare payments. So now there's an additional fund which has been created, which handles chronic illnesses, critical illness, and in addition to emergencies. So the scope is so much wider. Mm -hmm. So I want to reassure people 
that the logic underpinning the conceptualization of this thing is sound. Okay. It is not that people sat in a room somewhere and one day just woke up and said, let's get rid of NHIF and introduce something else. Mm. The logic is sound, the intention is noble, and if you ask me, the team that has been assembled at the Social Health Authority, starting with the board, yeah. is a team that has been very carefully chosen as well. And it's a team of competent people. So I've, I've got no doubt that the okay. execution of this thing is going to be disciplined. All right. So Davide, what is intrigue. your concern with this? You know, I must say that uh, my brother Olwen is very good at giving a very really flowery uh, contribution on this uh, Social Health Insurance Act or fund. And the biggest concern we have is that, uh, in reality, the Social Health Insurance Fund is actually going to impede access to care. It's going to reduce accessibility to care to so many Kenyans. How? Why am I saying this? Uh, because uh, on its rent rollout, it's going to be a baseline cover, whereby if, for example, uh, you go to the facility and you're going to get a service, and the received service is about 100,000, like I said earlier, you, it will cover a particular portion, let's say 30% of it. The rest of the percentage you have to contribute as yourself. The out-of-pocket expenditure will increase also because of the civil servant cover. For a long time, we have about 6 million Kenyans or civil servants who have had what we call comprehensive medical cover, where you can access any facility in the country uh, as long as you have the comprehensive cover. And this cover was based on the fact that the medical allowance that civil servants were earning was relinquished and paid to NHIF. And again, on top of that, they've been paying the 1700 per month. So a civil servant have been paying about the 5000 plus the 1700 annual, uh, every month. Mm -hmm. So this gave them access to, to every level of care. Mm -hmm. So it then means that once these, uh, this has been removed from yeah. this particular shift, they now have to actually contribute. Uh, they, they have to get out of pocket expenditure if, get, if they go to the hospital to seek this care. Okay, so what I want us to do is we yes. want to pose these questions one at a time so that yes. Daktari addresses them. Yes. So you've said that yeah. the out of pocket expenditure will increase. Will increase. Daktari, is it true? Let him answer you in the spot. That is not true. And I'll tell you why. Okay. If you look at the current budget of NHIF, all right, compared to the per capita financial inflows that we expect into the health sector based on this. For example, if we take NHIF to be equivalent of social health insurance fund now, we have got a primary care fund which is funded by the exchequer, which did not exist before, to the tune of possibly 50 billion shillings. We've got the emergency chronic and critical illness fund, which is also again funded by the exchequer, which is an additional 75 billion shillings. And I've told you the entire spectrum of healthcare, what he calls comprehensive, I don't know what he's calling comprehensive if it's not what exactly I said earlier, where we're talking care, taking care of you from pre preventive, promotive, curative, rehabilitative, palliative, referral services. And that's, the, that's what I call comprehensive. Okay. So what we're saying is, he, you see, he, he's, he's looking out for interests of his members specifically. Mm -hmm. I am looking at it from the country perspective, the entire population. Okay. So one of the principles of social, social health insurance is it is supposed to be global. And you cannot have some people being more equal than others in this particular scheme. Egal egalitarian principles is what guides social health insurance. So one thing I know is we have increased the entire scope. So chances are even if they were to get enhanced cover from somebody else, the proportion they're going to need to enhance is going to be much less. Okay. So in, in summary, there are more funds that have been availed, so out-of-pocket expenditure cannot go up unless you're telling me that the total health expenditure in the country has gone up. Mm -hmm. If the total health expenditure has stayed a constant yeah. and you've put in more money, yeah. out-of-pocket expenditure is going to come down. Okay. So the format is I'm going to give you a chance to rebuttal, then we go to Christine to raise a concern, then the questions go like that, and Dr. Terry answers them in real time. Yes. You know, uh, as we talk about the Social Health Insurance Fund and yeah. talk about the access to care for uh, even the primary health care that we're talking about, we're looking at level one, two, three of hospitals in the country. And you know the facilities we have in this country. If from the census report that was given from the Ministry of Health, it indicates that only seven hospitals across the country uh, can actually give you uh, an access to care uh, where there's, there's personnel, where there are the drugs, equipment for that care. So when you're saying that, uh, the, uh, so, so it, that, then it means that majority of Kenyans will be going to these public facilities and end up in the private facilities. So ideally, uh, the reality of, of, of the cover that uh, Dr. Lwenyi is talking about here is more so geared towards getting this money to the private sector. And that's why we are saying there's actual need yeah. that the primary health care fund, which ought to be in the counties, 
the, the, uh, to build up the county facilities so that you have access, you have that, the scaling in the county, you have facility care in the counties. But in this scenario, we're going to have level one, two, three in the counties competing with the life cares, the bleeds, and the likes. So how many people will be able to access those facilities? Okay. Ideally, that's one of the biggest concerns. The second concern is that the contribution framework for the Kenyans, if you are in formal sector, you have to contribute upfront annually. How many families will be able to contribute in that, in that framework? And if you can't contribute, you can't even access the emergency care. And again, in the regulation, the particular facilities that have been designed to get the emergency care. So it means that today, if you get an accident and you, you are near an, a particular let's say it will be hospital or near a particular hospital in, in Westlands, you will actually have to pay deposits to access this care. That's why we are saying, ideally, the compressive nature of care that you are talking about should be such that when you access this care, you don't have to again pay. In this particular act, it is said that you are supposed to go get your employer to get a private insurance. The other day we were discussing about the regulations. We say, why can't the regulation come out with the tariffs? So that I know when I go to the hospital, I know how much I'm covered. Okay. It just say that it's unlimited. You won't have any, uh, you, from when you exhaust your, your primary care. In fact, there's a very funny thing, that from primary care, you have to be referred. And you have to be referred to dispensaries and health centers that do not have personnel before you can actually be covered in the in the level three, four, level four, five, and six. And in those levels, again, the thing, the shift, which is a social pool of fund, is, can be depleted. How do you deplete social pool of, of fund? Then from that point, when they bring up the aspect of chronic and, uh, and the, uh, emergency care and critical care, which these are exchequer funds that actually should have been reinforced to ensure the public functions better. Okay. Yes. Dr. Daddy. And thanks. Um, I'd like to clarify some things here. Yeah. We talked about preparation of facilities. I do admit, all right, that our facilities at the moment might not be as, as prepared as we would wish, mm. and especially possibly in the, in the public sector. That is something which is also being addressed. And that's, you see, this legislation, especially the Social Health Insurance Act, was not passed in isolation. There's a, there's a different uh, bill, which was uh, act which was passed called the F Facility Improvement Financing Bill which is meant, first of all, to ring fence the, fence in the funds in those facilities so they can be used for healthcare in those facilities, as opposed to the current arrangement where the funds are, have to be transmitted centrally and there's no guarantee that they're going to be using those facilities. So I do agree that for us as a social health authority, we're going to be in the business of paying for healthcare. It is important that the healthcare is actually provided in those facilities. That is the reason why even the social health authority on our board, we have got representation from the Council of Governors and the CEC Health Caucus. Then secondly, once we inject those funds there, we are, we are hopeful that the funds, once they are ring-fenced and they are paid from the social health authority, will help to increase the capacity in those facilities. Now, he's talked about uh, streamlining the referral system. That's a good thing. It's not a negative thing because if you streamline the referral system, you don't want people, people who have got colds to go and seek a, a cardiologist. That is not prudent use of the resources. What we need is for it to be streamlined in emergencies. You can go to any facility. And he's also made a statement here which is not correct. Emergency care is for every Kenyan. There's nobody who will be denied emergency care. That is funded by the Exchequer. It is not a member's fund. So primary health care, health care and emergency care is going to be provided for everybody. The issue of annual contributions. Annual contributions came about because of this. In the previous system, we had adverse selection. When I, what, we, what we refer to by that is people were contributing erratically and they contribute on the basis of perceived need. You cannot have a social health pool where people contribute because, for example, you can't be anticipating you'll need surgery that costs 200,000 shillings next month or in two months. Then you pay the 500 shillings, pay 6,000, and then go and consume 200,000. Then after that, you don't contribute. In other words, you're saying you want to consume the resources, but you're not contributing to the general pool, which is against the principle of insurance. So what was decided? Let us have annual contributions, especially for those who are self-employed. I know there's a little bit of a strain in terms of being able to get those resources. That's why it was said we not need to look for ways in which people can finance these. All right? So you finance it and pay it in installments. Okay. However, what you also need to mention is that those who are indigent, now we've got a means testing instrument. All those people who cannot pay will be paid for by the government. Okay. So there's nobody who's going to be denied care on the basis right. of saying they're not able to pay. Then, no, wait a minute. Let you talk to the issues you raised. Yes, <laughs> you raised many issues. Yeah. Then in addition to that, there's the aspect about, he said, regulations need to come with tariffs. I know that's an issue of what comes first, the cart or the horse. 
tariffs, if you want to fix a price on something, you can't fix a price without knowing what kind of you budgets you have, you isn't it? Fix, you fix, right? Uh, so the regulations, for example, at the moment, at the moment, we've said it's 2.75%. Yes. But that is the subject of the public participation at the moment. If that number changes, it would mean the tariff has to change because your financial relations change. For example, another issue which is contentious at the moment was the issue of how do we make it mandatory because that is what is in the law. And for social health insurance, everybody needs to contribute. Everybody who can contribute needs to contribute. Those who can't will be paid for. If, for example, that doesn't go through, how do you meet the financial projections and therefore deliver on your mandate and your promise? So we can't promise yeah. based on a certain tariff without yeah. knowing whether our financial projections will be. Okay. Have you hold your thoughts? Hold your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> them down. You pose you. I'll give you the next round of questions as well. Mary, what is your concern? Thank you, Trevor. And um, let me just start by saying uh, where Chair is saying uh, emergency services. Yeah. Even in the current regulations, it's said that everybody should receive. But we've seen Kenyans suffering, not receiving those services. Um, let me go to my first concern. Uh, the, one of the reasons why we're shifting from NHIF to SHIF is uh, the, the issues of consolidating these services to avoid that fragmentation, which is said to have costed Kenyans a lot in terms of uh, money and time while seeking healthcare services. But I'm also thinking uh, in terms of these services, the, the current ones that we have provided for in SHIF, having three different funds, is in that already fragmentation itself to just look like what was there before. That would be my first. And then my second would be on the means testing. Uh, to me, uh, it is a very speculative method. From what is provided, we cannot see the clarity of what exactly are we using to look into these family holds, uh, households to determine how, you know, the ability of contributing because, uh, you know, someone who is farming and they are, they are producing some farm produce when they sell, do you even look at the money from the profits they get or from the, the all costs of what they have used? How sure are we it's going to be fair to the citizens? Okay. Yes. Those are three questions for you. That's why I give you the paper so that you can write them as you answer one by one. She says emergency services, everyone is supposed to receive it. Where, where are the guarantees this time that they will actually receive it? And then there's the issue of the different fragmentations. You have three different funds. And then there's the issue of the means testing. It's based on speculation. Extreme speculation. Starting, <laughs> starting, starting with, the, with the aspect of uh, the fragmentation. Yeah. Uh, she lost me a little bit because she mentioned, she seems to be mentioning SHIF as, as if SHIF is just one of the funds under the Social Health Authority. Yeah. So I'm not too sure what, the, what she was referring to. She's here to clarify. Uh, uh, clarify. It's, um, sorry, the three funds and uh, the, the Social Health Authority. Authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the, the are three, meaning, uh, for example, like he was asking, at what time do you decide my primary health care fund is depleted and now I need to move to the next one. That confusion that might come from, you know, patients waiting to know this time I'll access uh, services at this point using this kind of such issues, yeah. The entry into the system is through the primary health care fund mm. in the absence of an emergency. If it's an emergency, you end, enter the system wherever it finds you, wherever the emergency finds you. But in terms of primary health care, you enter the system at level one, two, three. Then you are referred upwards if need be. Now, when you go into level the social health insurance fund, there you have to be a paid-up member for you to be able to access those those benefits. No, you have to, you actually, have even to access member. to access the primary health healthcare fund, to access the emergency chronic healthcare fund, you must be paid-up member. No, that is that, that is not correct. That's why I'm, is, I want no, to. That uh, should, uh, that's the right. two of this that's, act. Let me let me let me, yes. let, let me educate the public, yeah. please. Let's not mislead people. Yeah. I know my I know my stuff. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. The primary health care fund, you need to be registered, not fully paid up. We just need to take your information to know you're a Kenyan and you're entitled to this service. Not fully paid up. To access the social health insurance fund, yeah. you need to be a paid up member. And the same with the chronic and Critical but, illness but fund. Registration is paid. Yeah, well, let, let him finish. Okay. <laughs> Doc. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go into the, to the social health insurance fund, you need yeah. to be a paid-up member. You're asking when you deplete your benefits, you'll be in touch. When, as you access the services, you'll be in touch with the social health authority. When you deplete those services, you're a fully paid-up member, you automatically move on to the emergency chronic illness and uh, emergency chronic and critical illness fund, yeah. right? So that happens automatically. For emergencies, it's any time. 
you get an emergency, you'll be able to access the service. So the reason for that fragmentation, one is to streamline our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And because we have got different funds that are funded differently, primary healthcare from the Exchequer, social health insurance fund is a member's fund, and the emergency fund is also funded by the Exchequer, but again, it is funded by the Exchequer for those who are members of the of the social health insurance fund. I think that clarifies. Is this very different from NHIF anyway? Because when you uh, even NHIF, you still have to pay. That's if, if you want the services to be offered to you. But NHIF is the equivalent of only the middle fund, you understand? And so we've expanded the scope now because yeah. it means that you can get additional benefits which you didn't have before. Okay. Yes. Mary. But, but, no, 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 I'll give you a chance now. <laughs> let, let Mary get a second uh, chance for a battle, then I'll come to you. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think around it. Um, yeah. He tried to answer, but again, I'm, I'm looking at the technicalities of the implementation mm -hmm. because, you know, that, that day of transition, all that old, you know, way of how patients are being seen by NHF, everything of that moves to the, the, the authority and the chief here. Yeah? Yeah. And we, we're trying to look at a transition that is quite smooth. And don't forget, they're also telling us that people have to register anew. There'll, there'll be no transitioning of the old data to you know, the, the new data. So should you even fall sick even before you transition your data and all this? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at ensuring that smooth transition of from the old yeah. to the new year. The transition process. Mm. The transition process is also well thought out. Yeah. We have got two boards that are running simultaneously. Mm. The NHIF board is still in operation and goes on until the one year expires, which is technically November, November this year. Mm. We have got the Social Health Authority board, which has also been inaugurated, also operational. Then we have got a transition committee, which is supposed to help these two groups shake hands like this. So it's tidying up the process in terms of being able to tidy up the assets, liabilities, any, in fact, even transitioning the staff and so on. I want to reassure Kenyans there is going to be no crisis, even up to this point in time, despite even the legal encumbrances we had. Service has not been disrupted. Our focus is going to be on operations. It is going to be a smooth transition. We are focusing on operations at the moment to ensure that we seamlessly transition people from one service to another, even for those who have already paid their NHIF membership uh, fees, for example, in advance. Yeah. It is going to be prorated based on the new rate Whatever the new rate is, if, for example, you, you're determined by a means testing instrument or you're somebody who's on payroll, we'll say this is what your new rate is. Therefore, this is how much you have paid. This is the date you've paid, top up. Or you, so all those things have been taken care of. There's a transition committee which was gazetted by the CES Health uh, the other Friday. And they're already in operation. We even had meetings. They're having meetings, and they're reporting to the chairman of both boards. So okay. everybody's in the loop in terms of we are taking this matter seriously, but I can assure people that there's going to be no point when somebody goes to hospital and they're told there's nobody who can fund your health care because we're in a transition. Okay. Martin, your chance for the question. It's not answered the question. Thanks the so means much. Okay. Means testing. <laughs> means testing. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> record the means testing. Means testing. And yeah. whether it's just speculative. Then means, you means, that. means testing, again, yeah. is a pretty well-known scientific method. The truth is, most of us don't understand the details, right? But it uses various socioeconomic characteristics to be able to determine what your means are. And it is based on the, on the principle that you want to be able to use somebody's consumption to be able to assess what their income is. Mm. And it's a more reliable method. If I came and asked you directly, how much do you earn, Trevor? And you knew I'm trying to use that as a basis for determining what your premium is, chances are you're going to try and reduce that figure, mm. right? But if I asked you general questions, hey, what kind of watch do you have? And what kind of phone do you have? And what car do you drive? And where do you live? And so on. We should be able to, they have got a scientific method being able to, to gauge that. The reason why means testing was important. Yeah. You must remember we talked about equity. There are a lot of people who are in the self-employed category also who are not carrying their weight. You can't have somebody who's earning 100,000 shillings paying 500 shillings a month like the other person who is earning 5,000 shillings a month. So what we want to do is, the, just like the people in formal employment are going to step up their contribution slightly, it is going to be that, again, those people who are self-employed will need to pay their way in this case. Okay. And that is the basis. I think no, 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 it, no, no, let me just tell about this thing of main testing. You know, yes. when he's saying that... Uh, and this, the means testing question was... Yes, I'm just trying to, to demystify de de what you say. Yeah. In reality, this country is even struggling to even know uh, the, the people who are suffering from floods, even from drought. Tell me, how will they actually know that you, you, are, you are rate, you are handing this amount of money that you yeah. need to contribute these this, this figures? Okay. So it's actually uh, a, a fallacious statement. But it is data from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. Even during the census, that is a question that they ask all the households. And the yes. idea behind this, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Dr. Luen here, yes. is that... What they're trying to establish is the people who really can't pay, 
who then has to be paid for by government. But see, the time it to, is not so much about getting the, the exact figure. They tend to look at the 80% of the population. On the, they tend to look at everybody who is not salaried on this prospect. Yeah. Yes. So how, how, to what extent is it going to be speculative? Okay. Yes. He'll answer that again. Let's bring in Martin. Martin, your turn for questions. Now, what but, are your concerns? Thanks, Trevor. I think I will start at the transition. Okay. Uh, I will uh, want clarity from Dr. Luen. Uh, what is the status of Linda Mama, uh, uh, the free maternity care program yeah. uh, that existed uh, under the old system? Bear in mind that uh, provision of maternity care services is a responsibility of both national and county governments government under the Health Act. Mm -hmm. It is not a creation of this new statute. It is an obligation that exists. So what is the status of Linda Mama? Secondly, health care is for the population. What is the population of this country? We are largely a young country. We have uh, a majority uh, adolescents and youth. And here we are talking about a health care system designed for the smaller uh, population. Why? The conversations both in the regulations and even the statute talks about um, health care and uh, does not cover the, uh, the, the part of reproductive health care services. Article 43, 1A of our constitution talks about the right to health, including reproductive health care. Health for adolescents is excluded in all the options. It does not feature where do the young people get health care. And what is their entry point if you are requiring a national identification for purposes of registration? What is their entry point? Secondly, and I think that is my third question, is dealing with the traditionally under um, NHIF, and in particular the Linda Mama program, there was a challenge in dealing, for example, with complications in maternity. Uh, NHIF used to pay for delivery, but when there are complications, you end up with women being detained because of their inability to pay. In the current setup, the few questions we'd want to ask. Where is the provision for uh, maternity health care, in particular complications during childbirth? Where are the provisions for provision for dealing with uh, pregnancy complications like ectopic pregnancy, safe abortion services, contraception? Where is that provided in the regulation? Okay. Dr. Ari. Starting with the Linda Mama. Yes. Um, Linda Mama was just one of the programs that we had within the NHIF um, architecture in terms of the schemes that they were managing. The new thinking was, if our approach is to go universal, and now we're covering people based on households, those mamas come from a particular household. So if the objective is to cover all households, the mamas will also be covered. So there's no need to provide for them separately. But at the moment... There was, there was duplication of a lot of the schemes. For example, even with the edu is another question that we kept being asked. You've got somebody who is in school, they're being covered through Ministry of Education through edu -Afia, and again, again, the parent also has got cover, so this child also has cover. That duplication is what has gotten rid of. So now, there'll be one standard package for everybody, but it's comprehensive because it covers delivery services, it covers all these other reproductive services you're talking about. Compli complications are covered. If you look at the benefits package that we, were, we were, that we are going to be looking at in terms of the public participation, complications are also but covered, whereas yes. NHIF was not covered. So I think your concerns are taken care of. You, uh, I don't know whether there's any question I've not answered. But, um, uh, I think uh, is, you've uh, talked about maternal complications, reproductive health care for adolescents. Yes. Yes. Those are covered. The entire range of services is covered in the benefits package. Okay. So everything is incorporated in this single standard package for everyone. Yeah. So we had not segmented and said we're covering adolescents, mamas separately, students separately. Okay. It is one package for the entire but population. You, Trevor, I've had the liberty of trying to look at the proposed regulations. Unless the other regulations, uh, apart from what has been put out for public uh, conversation, if you look at the package, there is no provision, for example, of contraception. It's not there. How will you offer primary health care where you are not offering contraception? Look at services being offered in uh, the dispensaries and health centers. Because that, he said that is the entry point. If basic services are not available at the entry point, where are you going to get them? Okay. I would be more than willing to share that information with you. And that's why I'm saying this public participation, yeah. Trevor, is extremely important. Because you can see even amongst this panel where I've got my colleagues here, the information is not sufficient. This, is, of course, is partly because of the time frame that we, we were not able to move in terms of the legal encumbrance. But now, 
we will get this going and get the information so that people get to get better information and are more relaxed that the scheme covers all their interests. Is it on the paper? Is it on the document? It is on the benefits package. I was reviewing oh. this even this afternoon with the board, so I know for a fact, I know what I'm saying. That is in the, in, no, but in see, the benefits uh, package. Shiva, they, we, have to take we, a, we had a meeting with them. With, yes, you're, <laughs> taking, you're taking the next, the next round comes to you again. Then we'll do the same round again. Quest, two questions and then a rebuttal. And also the people sending in their questions at Trevor Mbidi at Citizen TV Kenya. Use the hashtag Monday Report. We have Dr. Ari yet once all your questions in terms of the new health insurance scheme. What are your concerns? We'll pose those questions to him as he answers them. All right, see you in just a bit. Thank you.